Good evening. I am Gwydion Sullivan, Penn Faulkner's Executive Director. And I know this is Zoom, but I can almost feel how many people are here tonight. And I am so excited about that. Now, most of you probably know Penn Faulkner, but in case some of you don't, we are a national literary organization that's best known for giving out the Penn Faulkner Award for fiction and the Penn Malamud Award for excellence in the short story. But we also run a variety of education programs that bring visiting authors and donated books and writing instruction into underserved classrooms in DC, all at no cost to the schools to inspire the next generation of readers and writers. And of course, we also hold public literary programs like this one. At Penn Faulkner, we believe that American culture only thrives when stories from diverse perspectives enrich our lives. And tonight, we are very lucky to hear from three people who tell stories that represent very different perspectives on the human experience. We have Nicole Chung, the author of the forthcoming memoir, A Living Remedy, which is coming out in under two months, very exciting, and the national bestseller, All You Can Ever Know, which was a finalist for the National Books, Book Critics Circle Award. And Nicole's writing has also appeared in the New York Times, GQ, The Guardian, Vulture, basically everywhere. We have Isaac Fitzgerald, the New York Times bestselling author of Dirtbag, Massachusetts, who moderated our literary conversation on neurodivergence a pandemic ago. You can see Isaac on the Today Show and read his work in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Esquire, The Guardian, again, basically everywhere. And we also have Margot Jefferson, a Pulitzer Prize winning cultural critic and a recipient of the 2022 Wyndham Campbell Prize in nonfiction, who has published not one, but two memoirs. And her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Vogue, Newsweek, Harper's, once again, say it with me, basically everywhere. To my great delight, our moderator tonight is none other than Penn Faulkner's own Beth Ann Patrick, who is the literary programs chair of our board of directors, as well as an accomplished author and book critic whose own memoir, Life B, is making its debut this May. We are all looking forward to it. And her literary podcast, Missing Pages, is also an absolute must listen. I highly recommend it. And with that, Beth Ann, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Gwydion. I am delighted to be here tonight so that I can talk to these three memoirists who are so accomplished and such amazing colleagues that the honor is all mine, but I think the pleasure is going to be all yours as we talk to Nicole, Isaac, and Margot. And if you would turn on your videos and unmute yourselves now, uh, we can get started on our wonderful conversation this evening. Welcome all of you to this Penn Faulkner Literary Conversation. Hi, hi, it's great to see all of you. And we're all in different places. This is a virtual conversation, but I know if we were able to be here together in one place, it would be even better. So thanks for joining me, colleagues. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you, Beth Ann. Yeah, well, as I told you, I'm going to ask a question, and then I'm going to have each of you read uh, excerpts from your books. And the question is, for all of you, for all of us, really, what impels us to take on the task of writing memoir? Let's talk about that for a minute. What is it inside of us that makes us say, I am going to tell the world everything about me. And some, some of it will be beautiful and some of it will be problematic. Anyone want to start? I can jump first if that Please feels do. good for everyone. Um, I feel like I can answer this 
on two different levels. And uh, the first, I'll start with the uh, hopeful, optimistic level, which is I think when you share your own story, when you share aspects of your life um, that you maybe don't often bring up publicly, when you're really reaching down uh, for something powerful to, to put on the page, your hope is that it's going to make other people feel less alone. You are trying to be in conversation with the works that maybe helped you through your life. I grew up a reader and there are so many books and stories that made me, helped me make sense of my very complicated childhood. And so the hope, the optimistic answer is I wanted to share my story in hopes that it could help somebody else feel less alone. The less hopeful, optimistic, fun answer is um, I don't have a great imagination. So uh, fiction was never gonna be for me. Uh, memoir for me, don't, don't get me wrong, it takes art. You have to know how to tell your story. And that comes from years and years of reading and years and years of practice. But I am not one of those people that can just create a fantastical world out of my own imagination. I have a hard enough time making sense of the real world as it is. Uh, so for me, that's the, the, the kind of more lowbrow answer is that it's easier for me to write nonfiction. That's why I turned to memoir because I already have, for me, storytelling, it's like, you know, you have the clay and then you make the sculpture out of it. I already have the clay. And from there I can carve the story that I want to tell. Uh, very, very, very good and apt uh, way of putting it. Uh, Margo, how about you? Well, <laughs> um, I, it's tricky for me because I, um, I've i always found it interesting to read memoirs, but I had, until I wrote one, it was not that long ago, been quite resistant um, because I had a very strong sense of um, what, sh what should stay private in terms of the way I'd grown up and what should be public and a very strong sense of readers as judges um, of your character, of your past, of the world you were part of. Um, it's this business of, of examining uh, and dramatizing yourself, but continuing to find um, different aspects of the larger world in which to do that. That is, I think, the most interesting thing to me. So you can tell the same story in all number of ways. And as you're telling it, you know, you the, the lead characters change, the, the supporting characters change, you start um, assuming other personae. So, you know, it, it, it gives you, you and hopefully the world, but it gives you um, a sense of a continually unfolding. Um, it could be a narrative, it could be a lyric, um, and somehow it's, in, it's intermingling um, with your everyday self. I love that. I absolutely love that. Uh, Nicole, I know with your second memoir now as well, like Margot, you realize that we all have, it's, it's not just one story. Memoirists don't have to just write one book. Some write many. So talk to me about this question and how it affects you. Um, thank you. I mean, Margot, I love what you just said about one of the joys of memoir or the, the interesting challenges being that it's, you're always becoming and it's always changing and you're changing while you write it. And you know that when you come to an end point of this particular memoir, the story does in a sense go on. I actually love that aspect of memoir and it can make it really challenging to end one, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> like, hopefully, <laughs> you know, there's going to be quite a lot after. Um, I think like in terms of like why I was drawn to it, um, you know, I came to writing nonfiction and personal stories, like I wrote mostly fiction and really bad poetry, like it was bad. Uh, growing <laughs> up and, and through college, all the writing classes I took in college, it was mostly fiction and poetry. Um, and then uh, several years out of school, I was, I was in a, I was living in Durham, North Carolina, and I was anxious and I just felt like I needed a creative outlet and I hadn't been writing. And I joined a small community writing group and nearly everybody was working on memoir, which I had never written except for maybe one or two experiments in college and 
was similarly like, oh, but like, I'm actually a very private person, believe it or not. <laughs> and, um, but I loved what I loved about their stories and like what really drew me in about uh, the, the personal stories they were telling was like the way it made me think about people I had known, like people I loved, like my own life. And so that was like my first best lesson in this genre was that what happens to the person, it may or may not be all that exciting. It's probably fairly mundane in many cases, but like what was the art? As Isaac said, the art is in how the writer makes sense of that. Like they're like we, and, and at the time, like the books I was reading too, like they were, they were introducing me to these characters and these like lively stories, um, but they were rearranging like real life to do it. Like they were deciding what memories do I pull? Like what are the things a reader needs to know to follow me on this journey and actually care even though it didn't happen to them? Um, so that that's kind of what I love about it still. And you know, there are so many different reasons for writing memoir and the reasons I wrote my first are have very little to do with why I tried to write this, this last one, but I think, the unite, you know, the, the uniting thread is just what Isaac was saying about hopefully a reader reads it and it, it makes them think about their own experiences and maybe they feel like less alone. Thank you so much. All three of you gave such different answers and I'm always not surprised when that happens, but delighted. It's so wonderful to hear writers speak in different ways about their experience and especially about um, memoir wit for me because I've come through this so recently and it took me so long <laughs> but in any case I'd like Should to hear we ask you why <laughs> like, right <laughs> yeah you know it's like okay sold it in 2017 and now it's 2023 but you know what I managed to do it I finally finished last year on February 1st, I sent in my manuscript and, uh, you know, we all understand this, right? Then you wait for your agent to come back to you. And, uh, you know, I already knew we'd sold it, but I still didn't know if my agent was going to say, okay, I'll send it along to your editor. And the day that she called and I had, was holding my breath and she told me over Zoom, I love it. It, that's such a such a feeling. It really it really is. And because I want our audience to feel this as well, I'm going to ask each of you to read a brief excerpt. And uh, I know that we are going to go in alphabetical order. So Nicole, would you please start? And is this is from a living remedy, or is it from All You Can Ever Know? Um, I picked a passage from All You Can Ever Know, so I hope that's okay. I actually totally. don't, I don't have one of my own galleys anymore. I, I, I would have to like pull up the, the Word document if I was going to read from the next book. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for choosing this, and, and I know everyone will be delighted to hear. Thank you. It's a pretty brief reading. It's not from the very beginning, but it's, it's near the beginning. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, all you can ever know, my first memoir is about my experience growing up as an adopted Korean American uh, in a white family in Southern Oregon. And then what happened later when I decided to search for my birth family while pregnant with my first child. Um, but this particular passage, because at then we were talking so much about um, like writing from childhood, I, I picked a passage that sort of covers part of my childhood, so. Wonderful. One spring when I was 10 years old, my parents took me back to Seattle, the city where I was born. I remember many steep walks of hills that week, stunning views of mountains rising over the city. Standing on the deck of a ferry and watching the foamy white cleft in the ship's wake widen, I felt as though we were riding atop a skyscraper. My parents drove by the house whose attic apartment they'd once rented, and we slowed and lingered at the curb long enough for me to imagine my 20-something father or mother peering down from the highest windows. But my favorite outing of the week was to the Chinatown International District and the enormous Asian supermarket. The cavernous store was so different from the Food for Less, where we shopped for groceries at home. It was bursting with strange, wonderful smells, crammed with boxes and barrels of vegetables and fruits, tanks of live fish, and seafood and meat on ice, jumbled displays of crockery and ceramics and lacquered chopsticks. 
While there were a hundred thousand things to touch and taste and try to take in, what truly enthralled me were the people. Never before had I been entirely surrounded by Asians. I had seen others one by one back at home, but at this magical store, they were everywhere. Busy Asian shoppers hurried past us, clutching shopping lists. Asian grandmothers and aunties scanned products with a critical eye weighed down by large purses. Asian parents pushed carts and strollers, towing children by the hand. My mother and I cooed in unison over chubby cheek babies and toddlers with the same stick up straight, gravity defying hair I had seen in my baby pictures. The hair my white mother had struggled with so trying everything she could think of to make it lie down flat. At home, I kept a secret running tally of every single Asian person I had ever seen in public. I was on nodding terms with some of them. The woman at the minute market, the people who own the Chinese restaurant, the couple behind the counter at the donut den. But it was possible to go months, even years, without seeing any who were new to me. Walking around that week, I tried to play my count the Asian game and I lost track every time. Here, finally, I was inconspicuous. There was no reason for anyone to look twice at me, though in truth, a few passersby probably did glance at us their eyes flicking over and up to my white parents and then back to my face. It was novel and exhilarating to be one among so many, a glimpse of the world as it could be. I couldn't count all the Asians, but I quickly found another secret game to play. Although I believed I would never meet anyone from my birth family, that even if I did, it wouldn't be because they'd recognize me wandering the streets of Seattle with my white parents, I spent the entire week scanning the faces of Asian people walking by. Every time we passed an Asian woman around my mother's age, I couldn't help but wonder if she might be my mother, a relative at least, or perhaps just someone who'd known them. If I walked by them on the street, I'd recognize them, wouldn't I? I would just know. In passing, I imagine my birth mother and I would both suddenly be aware of a connection unexpected and undeniable, something in her would call out to me. I'd look into her face, overcome by a flash of familiarity, a memory woken. It seemed impossible we'd be able to cross paths like strangers and keep moving down the sidewalk away from each other, never to know, never to meet again. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I just, I can't. And yes. these zooms, I can't. I can't with the quiet. I gotta. Sorry. Yeah. No. I think that's. A, I think that's okay. That is. Oh. oh, oh um, and I have to say, okay, Isaac. Now break our hearts again. <laughs> um. This is this is uh, this is from my book, uh, Dirtbag Massachusetts, and. Uh, it's from an essay titled Confessions of a Former, Former Fat Kid. The slap of my mother's hand against my bare stomach rings out and fills the entire store. I watch as my belly jiggles in the floor to ceiling mirror mounted on the column in front of us. We're surrounded by racks of cheap clothes in terrible colors. Ooh, I'm sorry. I just, if you can hear a, a quick sadness, if you hear that sound, I swear that's not me just trying to like get the audience more sad. That's just my dog is uh, <laughs> is in the background, just 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 doing a little bit, a little, little confused by where the sun went. Sun went down, it's a little sad. So if you hear that, apologize. We're surrounded by racks of cheap clothes in terrible colors. In the mirror, my mother looks me right in the eyes. Her hand pinning my shirt up to expose my midriff. If you weren't getting so fat, I wouldn't have to buy you new clothes, she says. My skin stings as the red mark of her hand fades. I pull my shirt down and refuse to cry. We're at a Stewart's in Athol, Massachusetts. Stewart's was like Walmart for poor communities in New England back before Walmart realized it should be Walmart for poor communities in New England and everywhere else. I'm eight years old, growing, 
getting bigger. When we lived in Boston, my father made sure that I got exercise, taking me out for long bike rides while he ran alongside me. But my dad stayed in Boston and Ma and I moved out to the country. You'll have a yard, Ma said, and I pretended to be happy. I tried to play in the yard, but it didn't make up for the lack of bike rides or the Chef Boyardee for dinner most nights or the pasta and butter with a side of bread and butter on the others. Ma had been bigger too when she was younger and she wanted so badly to save me from that same fate. It didn't help that now we were living next to her parents in rural Massachusetts. In a town she promised herself she would escape, a town she'd successfully escaped right up until she hadn't. Now we lived in the house next to her parents in the town where she'd been a big girl. Now my mom lived with her son, but without her husband, who had to stay in the city because there aren't enough jobs out here, which I found strange because there seemed to be plenty of jobs for my friend's dads. And not enough jobs didn't explain why Ma cried most nights and why her Ma, my grandma, looked at me like I was the garbage someone forgot to take out. I'd sneak bowls of cereal when no one was home, pouring sugar and honey on the off-brand Cheerios, pretending they were the honey nut kind, the kind my other grandma, who lived near the ocean and never looked at me like I was trash, always fed me. I would wash the bowl before Ma got home from work. She would cry and I would hug her and do the only thing I knew how to do, which was not cry. The same way I don't cry now, under the fluorescent lights at Stewart's, surrounded by clothes that don't fit and we can't afford. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Wow. Okay, before we move on, we have one more excerpt, last but far from least. Margo, would you please read to us from Constructing a Nervous System, your um, amazing new memoir. Amazing, yes. Uh, all right, this is actually the opening. Um, hmm. I stood in a bright, harsh light. The stage was bare. I extended my arm, no, flung, hurled it out, pointed an accusatory finger, then turned to an unseen audience and declared, this is the woman with only one childhood. It was part of the night's dream work. And I was rattled when I woke up for I'd been addressing myself. My tone was harsh and my outstretched arm with its accusing finger had the force of that moment in melodrama when the villain, hitherto unsuccessful, I'm sorry, hitherto successful in his schemes to ruin the heroine's life when that villain is revealed, condemned and readied for punishment. I understood what I had to do. At the end of his stage show, Bill Bojangles Robinson would look up at the lighting booth and shout, give me a light, my color. Then, out, blackout. When the light returned, I knew it was time to construct another nervous system. For most of my adult life, I'd felt that to become a person of complex and stirring character, a person, as I put it, of inner consequence. I must break myself into pieces, hammer, saw, chisel away at the unworthy parts, then rebuild. It was laborious, like stone masonry. And on the stone masonry model, the human self says, go on, admires itself for saying, go on, and proceeds to go on. As I went on, I grew dissatisfied. This edifice was too fixed. I wanted it to become an apparatus of mobile parts, parts that fuse, burst, fracture, cluster, hurdle, and drift. I wanted to hear its continuous thrum, thrum go the materials of my life, chosen, imposed, inherited, made up. I imagined it as a nervous system but not the standard biological one. It was an assemblage. My nervous system is my structure of recombinant thoughts, memories, feelings, sensations, and words. Repeat after me. 
it's time to construct another nervous system. You write criticism, you write memoir. What will be your tactics, strategies, instruments for constructing this nervous system? I keep carping and fussing, rearing up against the words critic and criticism, such august, temperate words. They make me think Gertrude Stein was right, but nouns are boring because all they do is name things. And just naming names is all right when you want to call a roll, but is it good for anything else? When you're thrilled by a flying buttress, a sound chamber of notes and syllables, when an idea makes you feel as if the top of your head were being taken off, then abandon that too temperate prose zone and keep writing criticism. As for memoir, I keep attaching adjectives to it. Cultural memoir, temperamental memoir, what makes me so anxious? I want memoir and criticism to merge. Can they? And if so, how? Read on. Thank you. <laughs> Mutual <Love> appreciation. <laughs> yes. All right. This is, you know, um, I, there's so many places to start. And this is why I had to make sure that I gave myself parameters. So first, Nicole, the line about never having been surrounded by Asians before took my breath away when I first read All You Can Ever Know. And there are many people from underrepresented groups of all kinds who have had similar experiences, but the realization of the experience and being able to mark it on the page. This is something I see in all three of the memoirs we're talking about here. It's a kind of witness, isn't it? I think so. I mean, it's interesting. Like I remember feeling as though, um, I don't know, all you can ever know was the book I had to write first. I had no idea what was gonna come after that, um, but, it almost felt like I needed to make a little bit of space somehow for myself. Um, and, and part of that was growing up and just not reading stories um, by, I mean, not a lot of memoirs by Asian American women when I was growing up or essay collections, um, not a lot of like young people's literature, and then never ever seeing like a transracial adoptee experience in literature. Um, and so I don't know. I mean, for, that was also a reason why I felt it had to be memoir. I've been asked like by, by others, did you ever think about turning it into a novel? And I think they often ask because they imagine that gives you an, another layer of privacy, protection, whatever. And honestly, I never thought about that. Uh, just, you know, I just, I always felt like to me, just for this book in particular, there was something very powerful to me in the idea of um, like an adoptee telling this story and telling it as the truth. But um but yeah, I understand what you're saying about witness. And I think that was part of it, certainly. And um, I mean, Margot and Isaac, I'm sure you'll agree. It's one thing to like know a thing intellectually. Like in, in this case, I grew up and I was the only Korean I knew until 18. But like knowing that and then writing it uh, are, are two very different things. And then trying to explain to the reader why they should care. Um, it was it was another thing. So, so yeah. Um, I mean, but that the tone, the all the ways that you've experienced it, which tone do you pick, which, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, yeah. Which memory do you pick, you know, right. how, as you said, which tone do you pick, which details do you give, and Isaac, what you witness in moving back, I'm going to see if I can say this correctly, because Massachusetts has so many place names with interesting, is it Apple? Apple? Yeah, yeah we'll take it, we'll take it. <laughs> And so, you know, your grandparents' domain and their disdain are also heartbreaking. And so it's always difficult to write about our past, but writing these pages about being a fat kid, you know, um, especially I've known some other grown men who had had experiences of being a fat kid, and it always seemed to be such an awful tender point. And so writing these must have been very difficult, writing that scene you read. Talk yeah. About um well well just quick to start to start with the town name. Um there's just <laughs> there's a fun there's a fun story there, which is that the the title of the book Dirtbag Massachusetts, uh that title actually comes 
from uh, my good friend who's also a wonderful writer, Jason Diamond. Yes. Um, and, and that's because Athol, Massachusetts, I'll give you one guess what everybody else in Massachusetts calls <laughs> Athol. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we don't, it's a, it's a family program, but you get the idea. <laughs> it turns out, I mean, technically you can name a book that, you know, that Massachusetts, uh, but it's not going to do very well uh, as far as, you know, <laughs> getting out there into the world, search engine, you know, just a lot of people would be blocking it because it's just, you know, will a bookstore carry it? Uh, and so I was I was talking to Jason about how I, I couldn't, and for the record at this point, so much of this book wasn't written at that point. I was just in love with this idea. And um, and he was the one that said, without even, like it was too sad, it was so easy, it hurt. Uh, he just said, uh, Dirtbag Massachusetts. And immediately, like I, I really think at that point, the book that I, had, that the book that I was planning on writing is not what this book became. When I set out to start writing this book, it was a completely different book. And I'm so grateful for Jason Diamond for giving me that because that was a moment, I would say the first moment where it really began to turn. Uh, and then the next, the next moment was after I worked on it for 18 months without getting much done. Um, and the idea I had was I was going to write kind of about my own experiences, but with a lot more about pop culture and a lot less focused mm -hmm. on me. Mm -hmm. And uh, and after 18 months of, of not getting very far, I finally, every, but every, everything I try to write, all of a sudden there'd be seven paragraphs about my father, seven paragraphs about my mother or her parents. And, uh, and finally I called my editor and I said, I, I, I don't think this is the book I sold you. I, I, if, if you'll allow me, I think this is going to be a book about my childhood. And she said, I've been waiting about 18 months for you to figure that out. Um, <laughs> again, God, God bless patient editors. Um, but, but, but to get your, the, the, the confessions of a former, former fat kid, I do, it's former, former, because the, the point of the essay is that I, I continue as a human being to both shrink and expand. And that is just, it's, it's me coming to try, trying to not coming to, cause I'm, I'm, I'm very suspect of anything that's wrapped in a bow. That's a present that's perfectly mm -hmm. delivered. Mm -hmm. The point of this book is that everything's very messy. Um, but, but. But but what I'm trying to learn is how to be at peace with the body I have, no matter its size. Um, and that's why, yeah, when, whenever I, when people talk about this essay, it's often printed as confessions of a former, like they think it's a typo, but it's right. as a former, former fat kid on purpose. Um, because part of the essay is, is but it's the only picture that's in the book, but I, I show a picture of when I thought I was, when I, when I was most uncomfortable with myself, when I was most judgmental of myself and critical of myself and my body size. And at the time I was doing a lot of drugs and I was probably the skinniest I've ever been, but it, it, I, I wanted to show how it's, it's so much of the ways that we tear ourselves down and tear ourselves apart is, is a mental uh, right. game more than anything that's attached to reality. Um, so, th so that's what I was trying to tackle with that, that one. Well, thank you. I mean, it, dysphoria is so, so difficult. And, uh, you know, you're talking about, you know, tackling ideas about the body, but Margot, you um, are talking about and constructing a nervous system, ways of tack tackling ourselves as humans with all of these layers and ideas that are not part of our own body, but are part of our body. And so it's about construction and you almost had to construct a new way of writing. This is written so differently from your first memoir. And so tell us about that as, as a challenge or also as Isaac was saying, as something you fell into and thought, this is it. Finally, <laughs> I'm telling the story the way I need to tell it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I work in a lot of separate pieces, um, and it seems to, you know, I seem to need to do that. Um, I magpie, um, and then at a certain point, it looks hopelessly disjointed. Um, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I'm unweaving, you know, the, every night, and then I'll weave it again during the day. Oh, okay. oh yeah. <laughs> um, but one thing that helped. I learned with Negro Land that when I said, when I opened it by saying, I think the line was, I don't, dis I was brought up to, to distrust memoir. Right. I thought, oh, okay, that's the central tension in some way. I can, I can hmm. work my needs, my need to be narrator, chronicler, historian, to be dissident, you know, 
to be the exile from this black bourgeoisie, to be a watcher and participant, all of that can be handled through these, these tensions. Um, with constructing a nervous system, um, I, I had to say early on, wherever it began in the book, I want to, <laughs> I want to write memoir and I want criticism to have the, um, the intimacy and the acute mm -hmm. Um, and the mm -hmm. physicality, as well as um, you know, the um, the imaginative um, intensity. I want criticism to have that, and I want memoir. Partly, I guess, because I've been a critic so much of my life. I want the memoir to have to invite a kind of um, ability to be clinical, analytical, um, and harsh. <laughs> and hard on myself as well as well yeah. as um attempting right as well as as well as attempting to um to find um modes of understanding um modes of right. well you know it, this is i mean it's so interesting for me because I am neither the critic nor the memoir writer that you are margot but I do recognize those tensions and I recognize, and this is something I really wanted to talk about tonight, and I hope that our audience will, uh, you know, be interested in this, but I wanted to talk about process a little. Mm -hmm. And so I, we we're talking about challenges and tensions. So Nicole and Isaac, either one of you can jump in when you want to. What are some of the challenges for you in these memoirs? And maybe also what was the hardest thing that you learned about your own process. Maybe the hardest thing, Isaac, was that it takes 18 months to get anywhere. For me, it was certainly, you know, longer than 18 months. Um, yeah, I, there's a part of me that's like, I just want Margo to talk the whole time. I know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm learning so much. Um, I'm just like, I'm like taking notes. Um, no, uh, I want to be very clear. 18 months is when I brought myself to actually start the thing. Uh, it then took, just all I'm saying is it, it comes when it comes and it, it does take a long time. And I would, I, would, I would say to anyone that's watching this and thinking about writing your own memoir, writing your own stories, writing at all in general, all I can say is it's going to take longer than you probably think. And that bash is A-O-K-I um, I think for me, the challenge there were so many, but one one that that Nicole touched on earlier is just you you understand that you're sharing private moments. You're you're sharing, of course, you're sharing your own story, but none of us live in a vacuum. You are a hundred percent going to share other people's stories, and not their full, you know, incredible story. That they're going to be slices that are linked to your three dimensional story, and so. Um, one to connect it to what I was just saying about let it take the time. So if I'd written this memoir when I was 25, it would have been a lot. One, I was just a much worse writer. So it would have just been bad because of that. Um, but also it would have been a lot angrier. It would have been so angry. And I'm so glad that I, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm sure I attempted in, in my own ways back then, but I'm so glad that it took the time that it took so that I could grow a little older and I could grow a little bit more empathetic and I could see the people in my lives as the three-dimensional human beings that they are. Um, but but you still you still do get to this moment of of you're sharing this story and there are people in your life who who are 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 going to I mean there's no there's no way to sugarcoat it or make it easy. They they will be hurt um, by by the stories that you are telling. And so just one quick one is um, I, I knew I, I could not show it to my parents before I published it. I just knew that that would become another excuse to not publish it. Um, but I did want to make sure they had it before it was out in the world. And so kind of when I finalized the draft, um, I showed it uh, to my mother who, who is an incredibly intelligent woman. She reads and reads and reads. My love of writing, my love of books, it is because of my parents. And, um, and, and, she, and she read it in one night. I said, the, what, what I said to her was, you don't have to read this. We have a relationship outside of this. Mm -hmm. Right. This is art. You don't. But she's she's incredible. So she read it in one night, and she wrote she wrote me the next. You know, she, we got on the phone, and and a lot of powerful conversations happened that that I don't want to share, to be honest. But but one helpful one. She was just like, "Where are all the camping trips? 
Where, where it's never the thing you think it's going to be. Where are the where are the Thank canoe you. rides, young man? Um, <laughs> and and that's and that's that's when I said kind of what I said earlier about clay, and then it, you take the ship. What I said to her was, I was like, look, the truth is a, is a, is a hunk of wood. It's a log, mm -hmm. and I carved this particular sculpture out of the truth. I know your sculpture would look a lot mm -hmm. different, um, and and that's okay. And 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 me and my, I'm happy to. Like I said, that this book does not have a happy, tidy ending, but I can say after the book has come out, me and my mother are having some of the best conversations of our entire life. So that's been very I nice. just want to jump in there, Isaac, and say this is really, this is crucial to me right now because I do have one family member who has read the book and is not, um, you know, has chosen at least temporary, I hope not permanent estrangement. Um, but my mother, who hasn't even read the entire thing, she's read some of the chapters that I needed to have her read along the way. I said, okay, it's time for you to read the entire thing. You know, I'll get you a galley. And I said, this may be difficult and, and it's okay if it is. And she said, I'm too old to let anything get between, you know, me and another one of my children and, and, and one of my children. Um, mm -hmm. That's just not something. And I thought, this is the way I need to react to anything anyone ever writes about me. I mm -hmm. have children, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought that was, yeah. that was really, yeah. really a lovely mm -hmm. way. But I just want to go back to what you said and then um, ask Nicole this as well as Margot this having these great conversations this is what i wanted to do this is one of the things that impelled me to write memoir was to change the conversations to get things you know get 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 um, things out in the open to get secrets out of that confessional if you will isaac <laughs> you know so, so i it totally that that resonates very much nicole how about you um, what do I find hard about writing memoir? Like everything. Uh, but I think like with the first book specifically, it's the first book and you don't, you don't know if you can write a whole book, <laughs> like up until all you can ever know. The, the longest thing I'd written was like 5,000 words maybe. Uh, and I was like, wow, it's pretty like optimistic of them to like, you know, give me money to write this on proposal. <laughs> Let's see if I can do it. And so that, that was a huge stumbling block actually was just like, can I write an entire contained like lengthy like a book length project um but I also had to get to a point with the first book of um you know in terms of since it is it is hyper focused on adoption and like it was actually very easy relatively to figure out what went in it and what did not mm. I would kind of hold up these memories and think like is this relevant do people need to know to understand my adoption what it was like growing up as a transracial adoptee and like understand why I searched for my birth family. And if they didn't need to know that particular moment, it didn't matter how much I loved it or how like sentimental I was about it. It just ended up being cut. Um, so I was kind of ruthless really about like what went into that first book, but I had to get to a point in my life where I, um, because the book is, I mean, it's obviously personal, but it's ob also looking at these whole systems. Um, and there isn't a lot, wasn't a lot of adoptee authored literature, like at the time in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So I felt this additional pressure, sort of like a burden of representation that I wish I hadn't. Um, and I had to like learn to put down that burden actually before I could really write the story. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't be anybody's token. Like I could not be the good adoptee, um, happy, loyal, grateful, never questioning, like, uh, you know, never curious. Um, I had to kind of learn to put all that down and I couldn't have written this book, Isaac, to your point, I could not have written it in my twenties, like at any point, because apart from also being a much worse writer in my twenties, I, I didn't have the perspective and I was still like shouldering this burden in so many ways of like, what is an adoptee supposed to be? What do I owe my family? And I never thought about like what I owed myself and what I owed the truth. And I had to think about those things to write the first book. With with the second, I'm also relating to what you're saying about uh, like letting it sit for 18 months. <laughs> Wasn't quite that long, but um, my second book is very much about like grief and class and again, like a lot of systemic things. But uh, in the process of writing it, my mother got a terminal cancer diagnosis and I lost her two months into the pandemic. And so 
um, I didn't write for probably five, six months after, like I just couldn't, and it was just too painful. Um, so thank goodness for patient editors, but I do think there's a universe where another editor, another publisher might have pushed me and just said, look, you have a contract. I'm sorry, but like we need this book and we need it by this date. And it wouldn't have been the book it needed to be. So um, I needed that time and I needed to take care of myself and I needed to find grace for myself, which has been really late in coming in my career for me. Um, but I'm so thankful I found it because I couldn't have actually written A Living Remedy if I you know, if I'd just been pushing through no matter what. Uh, so I do want to echo what Isaac said about it will take time. It's going to take the time it takes. Hopefully you have people on your team who understand that and are supportive because I, I just think sometimes that is what the book needs so often. That's what the writer needs. Um, so. And, and I, I'm moved by both of you making so clear the we all, we each have our, our burden. <laughs> you know, the thing that it's almost, whether it's, representation um you know shame this all of the about this thing that is that weighs us down that's so hard it we know it needs to be transformed and that's what language and thinking and feeling will do but it's so hard you know <laughs> to to pull this rock from the chest and 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 let it become something else because we've been living our lives with the in these ways you know with these particular burdens that is so true. Uh, Margot and I were on a panel, um, one of Michelle Phil Gates' red ink panels, back when I had either was still trying to sell the memoir or had just sold it. And on the panel, you know, we had six, seven women, all of us talking about different, you know, ways, depression. And <laughs> yeah, that you know? was the subject. Yeah. Yes, it was the subject. And, but I mean, variations, but the theme was from depression. That's right. But I will never forget the moment when I said, um, you know, and I happened to have lived as a military spouse and Margo said, oh my Lord. <laughs> it's so because she in that moment was recognizing oh this is the burden you know this is what yeah. this woman is talking about that this is the burden that and i talking you know, around and talking through and talk, yeah that's right that's right and that's what we all uh you know uh, have to show and figure out you know what the um the, the central you know nugget or, or kernel there is and it's not easy um sometimes and this is I, th I think we've been talking about this, but maybe each of you could take it on a little more specifically. Sometimes we end up being really unsympathetic characters in our memoirs. You know, we are not coming off as, you know, here I am an angel to tell you about all of the wrongs everyone has done to me. You know, I think that's a really... <laughs> Right, Margot. It's a horror. It's a it's a deep temptation, I suspect, but it's but it's it's awful. Yeah. 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 And you have to you have to fight that. You mm -hmm. cannot and, and I mean Isaac, I think you might be well placed to talk about, you know, not putting yourself in the best light all the time. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm, I'm, writing I'm an angel. I'm an angel. I don't know. I don't know what you mean. Um, you are well, hang on. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on quick, but then I do, Margo. It, it looked like you had something to say on it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it to you. Yeah, yeah no, okay. yeah, that's right. I'm gonna... <laughs> Why didn't you go right in? I don't remember yeah, what I Margo, thought I had to say. No, one. you know what I think I was going to say, and that'll lead it right back to you. Um, I think <laughs> not. You know, once you realize you don't, you know, your great need is not to be loved, admired every minute. And I think make, that can be especially important for women because we mm -hmm. are so often raised to behave so well and so much seems to be invested. Um, but um, I think here, not only honesty, emotion, intelligence, but technique, you know, what, how, for, for me, it was changing voices and, and, and persona and moods really documenting mm -hmm. a lot of mood changes. Um, and that's what I meant about self-criticism too, trying to make that interesting. Um, yes. But there are a lot of other, there are a lot of ways to do it, but really, you know, technique has a lot to do with it. I think I'd love to know um, what Isaac and, and Nicole, how they found their way through. Yes. Yeah, no, but that's, that, I, I agree 100%.
for, for myself and absolutely, like I said, I'm an angel. Um, but no, I, I, it's a very quick answer for me, which is, listen, I, I want to be very clear about something. I'm so happy that I waited till I was 35, like I said, to write when I got started for the record, 39 now, um, 40, that's not true, 40, just had a birthday. Um, but I do want to say one thing. There's no rules, right? So if you are watching this and you're 20, you might have a not many incredible memoirs have been written by incredibly young or incredibly longer long in their life people that debut memoirs. Just yeah. one, there's no rules. But for me, you have to write an essay, especially a personal essay or a memoir or a piece of personal nonfiction writing that ends with, and that's what a good person I am. You have to be a tremendous, tremendous writer to make that interesting. You have to be a tremendous writer to make, to make that interesting. I'm not that good. Um, and so for myself, I, I'm not interested. I'm so rarely interested in the essay that ends with, and that's why I'm perfect now. Or that's, you know, that just that kind of, that, that just like, like I said, a bow on the end is, here's is my, never- Here's what I've learned. And yeah, exactly. So when yeah. any time, and you're right, Margo, you said it, it's tempting. It's so tempting to make yourself the hero of your own story. So I really tried to keep an eye out for that. Anytime I started, I, so sometimes you, you write it and then you can put it on the cutting room floor and then you can say, if you ask yourself, you reach into yourself and say, that, what did you really do? What mm -hmm. is, what is, you, I know how I feel about myself as a person and I don't feel that I'm a perfect person. I think I'm far from it. In fact, sometimes I think many of us can probably relate to this. I'm a very harsh critic of myself. And so it's about finding the, the flaws in myself. And I think that, I, I believe writing is beautiful and it's art and it's all these things, but I'm also a deep believer that it should be entertaining and people are going to be interested in flaws, in mistakes. They, they, they want to know there are other people out there, again, that, that feeling less alone thing, who have, excuse my language, but fucked up the way that they have. And so that's, that's the quick answer for me is I'm, I'm not interested in the, the essays that are like, I'm great. You know, I, I hope I haven't read very many of those. Those are not the interesting um, pieces of writing out there in the world for me either. Nicole, how about you? How do you feel about this? No, I mean, I've, I've just been kind of nodding along the whole time, but especially that last question to everything Isaac and Margo said. Um, I don't know. I, I tend to be just as a person, like pretty hard on myself. So this is not, I have many flaws as a writer. This is actually not it's one I personally... <laughs> This is not one I personally feel like yeah. uh, I'm super susceptible to. I have, however, like often, I think, especially early on, like it is very tempting to want to be like, um, not, not here is everything wrapped up in a bow, but like I've asked a question, like I love and I love, I've always loved starting a piece or writing a piece where I've asked a question and I want the reader to like accompany me on this journey um, mm -hmm. while we talk through it. And I feel like so much less pressure than I used to when I was younger to like supply a firm answer. Like it, it's really been kind of wonderful and liberating to realize like, nope, we're not done. And, and whether it's an essay or a chapter, an entire book, um, we're not going to get to, um, you don't always get to that firm answer. You don't always get to like a sign and here's the way to go if you wanna, you know, everything to be great. So maybe what I'm hinting at is like, for me, my, I think, I'm more tempted or used to be anyway, to kind of look for um, not a lesson, but like, I don't know, maybe a lesson. Maybe that's actually how, I, what, how I'm thinking about it. And I, I don't feel any pressure anymore to supply those types of answers. And that's been really helpful in my writing because life is just too complicated for that. And, and Marco, uh, I don't want to spoil anything in anyone's books, um, e even though, you know, memoir is less spoilable than maybe a thriller, for example. <laughs> but yeah. one of the things I really loved at the end of Constructing a Nervous System is uh, you're, you're talking about family, you're talking about your grandmother, and she had a nickname for you. Her nickname was Donkey. And <laughs> I loved the nickname because it just says so much about, you know, how we do need to keep going on. And Margo, you were talking earlier about all of our versions of ourselves and how we keep changing and growing. And 
uh, you know, a donkey just needs to keep going. That's its purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yes, that's true. And it will bump into things. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I thought, oh, this is, you know, and I, I know better as a critic than to say, um, I'm sure you intended that, Margot, but I also know that it just works so beautifully and it illustrates what everyone is saying about how you don't come to a fixed point at the end of a memoir. No, you know, I had an interesting experience in um, a seminar I teach uh, called Cultural Memoir, and mm -hmm. I was asking the first day my graduate students, well, you know, just tell me what about this form interests you? And I, and I was emphasizing cultural because I wanted them to be very aware of all the ways you can, you can exist in, in, mm -hmm. in a memoir. You can be a commentator, you can be a participant, you can be an observer, you can be an omniscient narrator, you can be you know, mm -hmm. minor character. But one student, she said, well, I'm a fiction concentrator. She said, and I find endings incredibly hard they're usually too simple they're usually you know too or too um virtuosic she said so I'm in a memoir course to learn more about how to write an ending mm -hmm. and I thought oh interesting yeah because endings are so this, hard <laughs> yeah and yeah, yeah I thought this is deep Let me, yeah. <laughs> like both of you all three of oh. you have been talking about this this business of the the yes. ending that's not an ending well, I think one thing that's so lovely about memoir is you can have this nice, big, open-ended, forward-looking ending, uh, and you don't need things tied up. And it wouldn't, in a way, it wouldn't feel natural because, as we've discussed, like your your life and the story are going on. Um, it's provisional. Yeah. Yeah. And then what I also love about about the genre is like recognizing, yes, it's like a particular story of what happened to you, but it's also like it's captured at this particular moment at the time you're writing it. And so if you were to write it 10 years earlier or like 30 years later, even if you covered the exact same events, it'd be like a wildly different book, maybe with a different yes. ending, you know, because you'd have the, the, those additional years or you wouldn't of like perspective on the story. But, um, but yeah, that's so interesting because I think memoirs are hard to end. And at the same time, I do like the way the genre lends itself to like a forward looking, um, well, maybe she was ending. saying in some way we're dealing, we're w willing to engage with its complications mm -hmm. um, more than she felt as a fiction writer. She mm -hmm. was, she was doing. And as did, a critic, did she ask, I want to. Sorry, did she finish the class? Do we know? She's still there. She's still there. This is ongoing. Yes, that was the first. We need to hear. We need an update, Margo. There's no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. I want to. I want to hear how. Sorry, there's no ending. It, it's it's <laughs> a perfect. <laughs> time. I want to know how it ends. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Me well, too. What I was going to say is that um, as a critic, one of the things with fiction that I've seen more and more over the past, let's say, 10 to 12 years are very lazy endings in fiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I said it. Yes, I came Ooh. out. And, said, uh, and people, I mean, you're a critic, so you can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and it's not because, you know, a book I'll read a novel and it will start out and it will go through and it'll be fantastic. And then who fizzles. And I think that Margot, your student is onto something that maybe this is, I'm not saying it's a flaw of every fiction instructor or professor, but maybe it's something that memoir can really help fiction with. Which we're always looking for ways to. And <laughs> nonfiction's constant search for our utter respectability and triumph. That's right. That's right. Here we go. Let's raise that banner high. <laughs> now, um, I think this is a really difficult question. And, you know, if the three of you are just like, we're not going there, Beth Ann, that's fine. But, you know, I think the question of what works for one culture and what doesn't work for another is really fascinating, particularly in memoir. And here's why someone recently told me that they were teaching Into the Wild by John Krakauer and that, you know, the protagonist whose name is escaping me right now, I should know, Christopher, what was his name? Does anyone remember? But anyway, the young man who winds up, you know, holing up in his van and dying in the Alaskan wilderness that her class was 
all people of color and they were furious with this young man in the autobiography in the in the the nonfiction book they said why did he throw away supportive loving family members all of the privileges he could have had um, so that he could go out on this individual you know adventure story that is that is a waste that is waste and I thought that is not something I've heard before. And so I was wondering in the communities all of us are in, which are all very different. Some of us are in, you know, many all at once. Have you ever considered, and Margot, I think you must have in writing Negro Land, um, what it means to be, you know, a good girl in one community and not a good girl in another. I consider these things, yes, all the time, or a good, you know, it, when I was growing up, the, um, you said, I think, Nicole, the, the good adoptee. Right. When in the 50s, the good, well-mannered Negro girl, there, there would be that. Um, but the good Negro, 50s, again, I'm using this word because those were its peak years, the 40s and 50s, um, you know, and then, so I'm, I'm as, as a reviewer, I was constantly aware of these different audiences. Um, you know, I'd be writing to and writing towards and, you know, did I want to have to explain something that I knew um, one audience might get and the others mm -hmm. wouldn't. Um, so, I, I mean, I think about it all the time. Um, I always assume, frankly, that I am speaking to, I, I sometimes am speaking more intensely to one group. Um, than to mm. another. Um, and I know that the, the, the points I'm making um, or the, you know, the passages I'm writing will, will resonate in different ways. Um, but it's inflection, um, I would mm -hmm. say. And in, in a certain way, I'm kind of resigned to the fact that I'm going to be understood and misunderstood by everybody at some, at some point. Yeah. Right. Right, which and is part of I mean, you know, just just class, gender, race, which one is right. trying to personalize, mm -hmm. you know, and make intimate as well as perhaps generalize about. But those are huge, and the variety within that. I mean, when you spoke about this class in John Krakauer, I found I'd like a little, like to know a little more. What kind of school was it? What was mm -hmm. the social mm -hmm. financial range among the students? You know, the stu there are a lot of variables even within that. There are. That's ex it, 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 exactly right. Uh, oh my gosh! I I have to find out more about that now. I will report back as well. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it no, is no. Very and, and and Margo, I felt like that was a fascinating, like and and absolutely on the money answer um, for the question. I my not to like follow up something very smart with a pop culture reference. No. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> one of one of one of one of my favorite lines in uh, the seminal '90s classic Wayne's World uh, is uh, the Led Zeppelin didn't make music everybody liked. Uh, they left that to the Bee Gees. Um, <laughs> and 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 I, I do like that. The 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 big the that's like a fun joke. But like the real thing for me is like like my favorite thing about writing and reading, and, and I'm gonna misquote it here, but it's, it's from uh, a British play, The History Boys. Um, mm. And, and the, the teacher is describing one of the incredible joys of reading, the powers of reading is like you can be reading and you'll come across a thought or an idea or in a moment or a desire or anything that you've, you've been quiet about, that you've held in your heart and you thought you were the only person that ever thought that. And, and as you, you read it, it's like a hand comes out of the book and grasps yours. <laughs> And, and you feel less alone. And that is like, that's the beauty of, of writing and reading for me is you write, that's an art form, but then reading is basically just two people coming together to make art. I can describe a bar and I know what the bar looks like because I lived in the bar for a long time, but you are all gonna picture your own version of a bar. It might be a bar that you lived at for a little while, or maybe it's a bar that your you know, mom was at a lot that you hated, like who knows, but you're all gonna bring your own memories and they interact with the words on the page. And that's where the real magic happens. That's where the real story happens. Um, and, and, and so in reference to, to, your, to your question a little bit is like one thing, I, I feel very lucky the, the criticism around my book has, has been lovely and, and kind, um, but listen, Led Zeppelin didn't make music everybody liked, right? And I am one of those weird people that just reads anything. Uh, I know that's maybe not the healthiest thing, but I'll read negative, I'll read positive, like I just read it all. Um, and, and one thing like 
we were talking just earlier about like, it's hard to know when to end. But the other fun thing with memoir that you can play with, if you, if you bring in time jumping, you can put different things in different places. And so throughout my memoir, you hear a little bit about a dark childhood. I'll give you flashes of it. Um, but I don't really get into it until the last essay. Mm. And I've read so many readers that were like, if he had just mentioned that up front, I would have had a lot more empathy okay. for him throughout the middle. Like if he had just mentioned it in the front, I would have, I would have read those that middle, I would have been less judgmental. But because he put it at the end, uh, this this guy's a jerk. And I just, I, but I love that. I love like that's it's actually something that I enjoy when I come across somebody like, sorry, I'm this is just a quick story, but like one of my favorite, this is this one guy, it was one line. I have a I have a story where I black out while riding a motorcycle. And the next day I, I, I give away the motorcycle. And this one person with one line just said, he blacked out, rode a motorcycle. And the next day he gave up the motorcycle, dot, 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 instead of giving up drinking. And I was like, that is it. I hadn't even had that. That is an exceptional point. Person who <laughs> like my book. That is, I, I'm gonna bring that into therapy. That's a very, very good point. But again, it just serves as this perfect example of like, some anyone's gonna they're gonna take things away from your book that you didn't even intend but yet they're still fascinating and interesting and sometimes even misconstrued but it's 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 part of it like margot was saying this is this is what we signed up for. Yeah. this is what we signed up for and um you know uh, endings are really difficult and i do have to end this in a few minutes and i hate that because i just want to keep talking to all three of you but there's one last question, maybe there'll be two, but at least one, there's one chapter I wrote of Life B that literally poured out of me after I listened to a particular song, okay? Mm. It just completely unlocked that chapter. And that doesn't mean the chapter doesn't have problems, that it didn't have problems, but sometimes that happens. And I was, I wanted to ask each of you if there were a memory or a smell or a song or um, some kind of walk or motorcycle ride that um, unlocked a piece of a memoir for you. Nicole? Um, walks are huge for me. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, I, whenever I'm really stuck, uh, instead of just sitting there and staring at the screen and like swearing, uh, <laughs> I just go for like a long walk. And uh, I know that sounds a bit cliche, but the point is I have to be away from the computer. I have to kind of trick my brain into thinking we're not writing. We're not even trying to write. We're not even thinking about writing. But of course, as I walk, it's with me because when you're deep in a book, especially like a long project like that, it, it never really leaves you. And so it's pretty easy when you step away to like sink back in and then, so walks help me. They just shake something loose in me. I'm like not athletic. Walking is like the extent of my athletic activities, but um, there's like pretty woods near my house that I would go into those all the time while writing the, the new book, A Living Remedy. And it was like on a walk one day where speaking of endings, like I like, I had, I wasn't even halfway done writing it, uh, the first bad draft, but I was like, I know how this book ends, which is shocking to me because I wrote three different endings for all you can ever know and did not know until pretty much the end what the end was um I was still like more than I had more than half of the book to write but I was like I saw the chapter the final chapter like so clearly like I went home and immediately outlined it so I would not forget and like jotted down like specific moments or bits of conversation I wanted to include and that actually made the rest of the drafting just slightly easier because I knew when I was writing toward, like I understood what the ending was gonna be. That's still my final chapter. Um, I honestly really love it and I'm very critical, <laughs> but like, I really, I love it. And it's partly cause it came to me in that moment where I wasn't really trying. Um, mm. It just was like, a, it was like an unmerited gift of grace, like that moment. Um, so I really, yeah, walking always helps me. Bretzatura, I love it. I love it. Uh, um, Isaac, Margot, anything for you? Walking 100%. I'm right there with Nicole. For me, oh, sorry. I, no, I, I was just thinking two walkers. Okay, that's all. Okay. I mean. <laughs> I, and I was thinking, I want Margot to speak last because I want to no, be able no, to. No, 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 you go uh, that walk. <laughs> but, um, but no, walk, Nicole's 100% right with walking, which is uh, for me, the only thing I would add on is, is I will see something. I stare at my screen. Oh, it's, I mean, one, just the temptation of the internet or anything else. Uh, some people are like, oh, it just flows through me. The right, for me, it's pulling teeth. Um, I would do anything else if I could, um, but I just it, devoted my life to this. Um, 
And so, but when I go out into the world, I'll see something and that can spark. So just, just what Nicole's like, like staring at my screen, I know what my screen looks like. I'm not going to see anything that sparks something, but if I go out into the world, I will see some scene, some object, some plant, some animal, something that will spark something. And that, that usually helps. Um, but for me, the, the answer, it would be therapy. Therapy is the thing that changed this book and, and changed me. And without therapy, the, like I, like it would have been a much angrier book if I'd written it younger, but it would have been a much less empathetic and not just the people in my, my life, but also to myself. And I don't mean in that, ooh, gee, look at how good I am. But in the real, I, I have a better sense of who I am flawed and all the all of it, um, and and therapy is it for me? Thank you. How about you, Margo? Um, uh, well, I'm not so much of a walker, but I like exercise. Um, mm -hmm. But um, you know, any kind of um, any not any kind of uh, di different kinds of music that will can shut down one mood that I'm locked into and start mm -hmm. off another. Sometimes I need it to be not even what I'm setting. I need it to be the radio, you know, and just whoop. Okay, fine. I'm catapulted. Um, that works best for me. Odd pieces of, of um, books, you know, um, like a paragraph that I that I love that I haven't thought of in ages, or mm. suddenly a writer's rhythm will come into my head, and I say, "Oh, I'll go read a go read that speech again, you know, from this play or did that." So it's 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 you know, you learn what your system um, needs. Right. You know, it's like biochemistry in a way. Um, into, you know, but this book constructing was so much about my my engagements and you know clashes with and passions for um, pieces of music, a book, um, a work of art, or whatever that you know that was constantly while I was writing it, setting me off, you know, and then mm -hmm. sending me on to associated um, uh, forms, art forms. I, I think it's it's so amazing, you know, which you know, sense or which sort of learning style does help us along through this process. And so um, we have some questions that I thought I will get to because this way we can answer them. At, there's not a ton, but that way you can answer them at any length you want. And fortunately, I always have more questions of my own. So there's not going to be a single moment wasted. Okay. But uh, I do love this question. Uh, what are your writing habits and rituals? Because I know people always want Want to know about them. So um, this is a question that's been posed to us by an anonymous attendee. So anyone who'd like to start. I used to write mm. intensely in the morning and then do more reading and note taking and whatever in the afternoon. Um, my, again, biochemistry seems to be shifting a bit and I'm able to do more real writing in the afternoon than I thought. Um, evenings, I don't. I don't write. I can take mm -hmm. notes, you know, but, you know, serious, serious, right. I can read for it. I can listen for mm -hmm. it, but I'm um, serious, serious writing. I'm not no good at at night. Um, um, rituals. We were talking about those with <laughs> the things that, that set us off, you know, that's right. Pieces of music exercise. Um, you know, sometimes you just want to call somebody whose voice pleases you, you know, he'll say mm -hmm. something that that'll amuse you, make you laugh. It'll awaken something else in you. Yeah. Definitely. Nicole, how about you? Um, I was just thinking that my kids are older now, but like I wrote the first book, at least in part of the second when they were younger and most of the second during the pandemic when they were home all the time. Uh, mm. So I just wrote when I could. <laughs> like I would have loved to, <laughs> like my favorite time to, of day to write is late morning, early afternoon. Um, but, and I like like you, Margo, I can, I can, I can, well, I can read and revise pages a little bit in the evening. Uh, I have to stop by like, nine or 10 o'clock or I cannot go to sleep. Exactly. Like, I don't exactly. understand how people write really late and then falls. Like, I mean, I, I need like a good one to two hour, ideally dumb television, but maybe also reading um, buffer between me and sleep after work. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I spent so many years while my kids were young, just kind of grabbing whatever spare moment there, there was. So my routine is like all over the place still. And I've been thinking 
you know, you could be more disciplined about this now. Um, but then I got a dog. So like my, my day is completely governed by her whims now. So <laughs> I don't know. Kind of discipline, you know, yeah, I, mean, I, yeah. Yeah. I usually write with silence. If I'm revising sometimes classical music, cause I can't have words, uh, in my head while I revise, but, um, I also, I like to read poetry either like before, or like I'll take a poetry break and mm -hmm. it helps me it helps me because poetry is beautiful and it's magic and I don't understand how poets do what they do, but it also helps me remember like, oh, we can say one shorter thing. <laughs> we can home, home in on one memory or one moment or one feeling or one sensation. And if I'm really stuck, poetry helps shake me loose because I think, okay, what's the next moment? And I don't have to think so big. So. Excellent. Yeah, that's, that's, that's perfect. Like, for me, it is about breaking it up. Like I was mm -hmm. saying earlier, writing is not something that comes easily to me. Um, and that's because I think for a long time, I just had this idea of what I thought writing was. And I thought one, it wasn't craft. It wasn't something you could get better at. I thought you either had it or you didn't. I thought mm -hmm. it was like a gift from God. And I was lucky enough that in my early twenties, I started to, to be around people who showed me that through community, through reading a lot, through conversation, through showing your very bad writing to trusted friends, mm -hmm. yes. give you feedback and honest feedback, uh, but but encouraging feedback <laughs> um, and not just trample on your dreams. That, that right. it was something you could become better at because before like that, like I, I had this picture, <laughs> like I, I like I did, like before I had any other furniture, like I had this desk because I was like, that's where I'll do it. <laughs> um, and that, that desk is just covered in clothes all the time. Because for me, it's about kind of what Nicole was saying earlier with walking. Like I take notebooks and I go out into the world. I'm like Margot as well, uh, or your, at least your previous. I, still, I haven't mastered writing in the afternoon yet. Definitely can't do evenings, but I got the juice in the morning. So my first thing, I try to get up and, and just get out into the world and I'll carry a notebook and I will just write. And that's because again, in front of a screen, yeah. my temptation, I write one sentence and I want to make it like Nicole, like I want to make it that poetry sentence mm -hmm. instead of just letting it be because I got so many other, if I have a notebook, scribble, 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 my spelling mistakes. Don't, there's no red lines or green lines telling me that I'm doing it wrong. I just scribble, 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 scribble out in the world. Then I come back and and that's when I can kind of transcribe my own handwritten notes. Yeah. And and that's my first review. That's my first type of editing. So if you're somebody who who finds yourself getting a bit of writer's block at a word processor, let me mm. recommend like there's nothing wrong with that old longhand. That's right. Nothing yeah. wrong with it. And I, you know, it was really interesting to me. I've only been to one residency thus far. I hope I have the good fortune to go to another, but at VCCA, the thing that made me laugh the most in the three weeks I was there is that all of the writers were on the exact same schedule. We were always mm. up at breakfast, chat, chat, chat. We would go, um, you know, at lunchtime, every writer you could tell was using their beds and their studios to take a nap. The writers were the first ones into dinner. Meanwhile, the sculptors, the composers, the painters might roll out of bed at noon, just get going at around five o'clock, have some wine, go back to their studios. The, writers were in bed lights out 10 p.m and then you know it, so i just thought if there's something about writing and that juice in the morning as isaac said and as, as margo said there i i don't know what it is but it really does work for so many writers uh now uh nika mavradi asks how does the genre of memoir connect to the practice of literary biography? And I just want to say really quickly that I don't know, I can write a memoir, but I know a literary biography. I'm going to leave that to, you know, really, really smart people like uh, the woman who wrote Heather Clark, who wrote Red Comet about Sylvia Plath. Uh, <laughs> so I know all I and know there's is there's also the woman who wrote the Carson McCullers, Carson McCullers yes. and me. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And of course, Ruth Franklin's Shirley Jackson biography. Mm -hmm. I mean, literary biography is amazing, but I don't know if there's, um, I don't know. I'm sure there are people who have written both. Well, um, what did the, I wonder what the questioner, I wonder what Nika herself would say about that, probably having taught both. Hmm. Possibly. I'm not sure if Nika is here to chat at us or ask another question, um, but. I can, I can take, I can take a quick oh, crack. Please. But again, I want to be clear. I, again, I want to say no rules. I'm only speaking for myself. I, and that goes all the way back. Earlier, I was like, 
I don't have the imagination for fiction. That doesn't mean right. many memoirists have incredible imaginations, but this sure. goes into kind of a similar answer. My next book um, is actually going to be all about Johnny Appleseed. Um, I know, hold your applause. Know. But let me tell you, <laughs> I'm cool. the man was wild. And just, you know, not to give away the, there's gonna be a lot of other stuff in the book. A lot of the spirituality speaks to me. Um, but one, if you're raised on him, you were taught, oh, apple tarts, apple pies. He was feeding, you know, the early pioneers, all this stuff. Uh, turns out, no, uh, the tarts, the, the apples were so tart, what women described them as, they would make a blue jay scream. Um, and it's, they were only used for one thing and that was alcohol. Um, okay. That's a fun fact. That is a fun, a fun fact. It's a fun fact that I can run with and use as an excuse to go walk around Ohio and Indiana and a bunch of random places making it a mem like making a story that I can tell about myself, the people I meet along the way. I do not have, just like I don't have that imagination, I do not have the deep research capabilities to do a Ron Chernow-esque right. literary biography that will be turned into a musical about John Chapman, AKA Johnny Appleseed. But with memoir, I can take fun facts and weave them into a story that I then myself go out and live. I don't know if that answers the question, but that is for me, I love a library. I love it, but I can't live in it. I need, I need to be out into the world. So for me, memoir is about making sure something is happening to me that I can then put on the page as opposed to figuring out a beautiful way to write somebody else's life. So if you're obsessed with them, then you are channeling yourself through. Um, through it, it, all the details, all the archival, but also you are you are using your imagination, mm -hmm. and that must feel very powerful and fascinating. No, also, and like Isaac, a lot of it, the, oh, sorry, sorry, no, Nicole. no, sorry, Abel. I was just going to say it's clear that uh, you know Margot actually lives in a library, so I just want you to apologize to her. No. <laughs> <laughs> they were gonna go, but then go. Like, I'm sorry, <laughs> Nicole. Please go ahead. Oh, no. I was just gonna say. I mean, I think um, I, I have not also not written literary biography. Although I, I was a history major, and I, I really love libraries and archives, and I would love to write like research reported nonfiction sometime. Um, you know, I have, but in short form. Uh, and I guess I would just say like it's still. It's still about the story you're still you know for if it's a literary biography what it has in common with memoir or a novel or anything else are the basic building blocks of that story characterization and scene and arc and all of that so i think i mean i think you use a lot of the same a lot of the same skills and a lot of the same toolkit but it's in service of a different thing which is putting this very particular person's story out there making it compelling making it real and obviously telling the truth which is more more common ground with memoir this is so great because the next question is from an anonymous um, attendee. How important is truth? That's everything, but it's also subjective. Um, I would say truths. With, right, exactly. With, so with, like with, you're with a big S, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you're and always getting perspective. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Nicole. Oh, I'm so sorry. Like the, but I was going to say the author. It's you're getting the author's perspective. Like you're getting their truth. Um, and it's an author's obligation in memoir to tell the truth, but they can only really do it from their perspective, no matter how much you research or report or try to bring in other people's uh, memories or thoughts or perspectives, it's still ultimately you're the writer and you're the one deciding what stays and what goes, like what's important and what isn't. So what I always think about when I read a memoir is I don't imagine I'm getting the whole truth. I, I know I'm getting just a piece of it, like a, the writer's view and there are all these these vistas that I won't ever see. Um, but I still find it a really beautiful thing like to have that, that one truth. And to be able to discern um, between and be given, there's factual truth, um, you know, there's emotional memory truth, mm -hmm. um, there's imaginative truth, you know, there are all kinds. Um, there's psychological, psychoanalytic, therapeutic truth. You know, in a memoir, you can render all of those. They're all part of, they're all your tools. And there are lies amidst all, all of them too, right? Yeah, yeah. that's, that's, that's to, to speak to the line part of it. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but truly like that is how important is truth. And, and I see that the questioner did put it in quotes themselves as mm -hmm. well. And that, I mean, I think the answer is right there in your own grammatical 
usage of quotes and everything that Nicole and Margot just said so eloquently and, and, and beautifully. The one thing I'd add with the, the case of like that, that memoir I would have written when I was 25 wouldn't have been a lie. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't right. have been a lie. I was that angry. Mm -hmm. um, I did feel that betrayed. It wouldn't have been a lie. Um, but I think to, to steal Nicole's use of vistas, or, or maybe it was Margot, I'm sorry, but like- Oh, that was Nicole. She got yeah, the vistas. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I saw more vistas. And so my, my truth, it was, it was still true back then, but it has changed a little bit. So that, that is something I think that a book or a memoir really does. It captures that truth, the author's truth, as they both just said, in that moment. Um, and, and even that can change. Absolutely. Or, or um, you know, there are two more, two more questions. I'm going to just read one because I want to make sure I don't miss it. But um, Janet Baldwin from Tacoma Park, Maryland says, Nicole, adoptees unite. I feel a connection with you as a fellow adoptee. Every adopted person has a unique experience. Yet, is there a commonality by virtue of the fact of being raised by people you are not related to? And if so, what is it? Um, thank, thank you so much. I'm, um, I always, you know, love to hear. Um, so, I, I mean, I think you've named the common ground, right? There are a million different adoptee experiences. There's no like one universal one, just like there's no one truth like we've been talking about, but um, I don't know. I think, I think the main thing I feel when I meet and talk with fellow adoptees, including adoptees who are writers, is just this sense of not being alone and being reminded that, you know, there are so many of us. Maybe another common experience is we often grow up feeling alone, sort of caught between um, maybe two different families or cultures or just not knowing other people with the same type of family family experience. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I feel, I always feel kind of a kinship with fellow adoptees and maybe that's where it comes from, is from that, that sense of like isolation growing up and then realizing, oh, actually like we're legion. There are like so many of us. So, and one of the great honors of being able to publish my first book has just been hearing from so many adoptees from like the age of 12 to 95. Um, it's really, it's meant a great deal to me. Thank you. Um, if someone who is anonymous again asks, how and when do you start a memoir? Interesting Ancestors, David Copperfield, chapter one, I am bored born, excuse me, <laughs> good or bad childhood school experiences, first professional experience, and when do you end? Now, we did talk about endings already, so I'm going to um, just ask very quickly for the three of you to talk about starting, and, uh, you know, Isaac, of course, you have an amazing uh, first line. I know you've talked about that many times, but uh, any of the three of you who wants to take that on, we have this is going to have to be our last question, unfortunately. There's others coming up and they're just fantastic, but I'm sorry, everyone, we have to end at 8.30, so. There's no one way to start. You start with what flames up in you. <laughs> you start with what will keep you going. That's what you start with. It could change, uh, but you know, just start with what is like the, the boom got to do it put it on the page yeah um i used to work as an editor and writers would pitch me like sometimes five different things at once and i would be like okay like i've got my idea about what i'm most interested in, but tell me what is most exciting to you like what's the most urgent thing for you and that's where you start isaac any last word no i think i think i think that is absolutely it the where, what makes you just flash in that way and then you just keep going and keep going because know that that first thing you might write might end up being your ending it might end up on the chopping floor it might who knows but the important thing is that you start you don't put it off till tomorrow if you want to take on a writing project whether it be a personal essay something small a poem or something as as long and as large as a book you just you start putting one foot in front of the other because that's the only way you're going to get to where you want to go Thank you. Thank you all so much. And I wish we could go on further and further. You, uh, this Diane. is wonderful. Yeah. So I am going to ask all three of you to stay with us for a couple of minutes. And I'm going to bring our development director from Penn Faulkner, Caroline Schreiber, onto the stage. And we're going to talk for a moment about ways that 
all of you can contribute to the interesting literary work that we're doing. So Caroline, please. Thanks, Beth Ann. And thank you to all of our writers for sharing your stories and your enthusiasm tonight. This has been such a great conversation, honestly. Um, I've had fun listening. So like Beth Ann said, my name is Caroline Schreiber, and I'm the Director of Development here at Penn Faulkner. So as you might know, um, Penn Faulkner engages thousands of readers and writers and students just like you through programs just like this one every year. Um, Penn Faulkner is, of course, a nonprofit, so we do rely on donations from supporters like you to accomplish our work. If you're able to give, we hope you'll make a contribution today. There'll be a link in the chat. Every dollar counts, and every dollar helps us to connect you with incredible writers like the ones you've heard from tonight, so thank you. Um, I'm also here to invite you to several upcoming Penn Faulkner events. So next up in our literary conversation season is collaboration. That'll be a conversation with two different teams of writers about what it takes to work together to create a story. And we hope you'll join us online again for that conversation on March 23rd. Again, um, there'll be a link in the chat and I believe in your inboxes tomorrow about signing up to attend that. And then finally, last but not least, on May 11th, we are celebrating our 43rd annual Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction. Uh, we're back to an in-person event this year, which is so exciting for us after all of these Zoom events and several celebrations online over the pandemic. So we'll be celebrating at the newly renovated and really beautiful MLK Library in downtown DC. The evening will feature our award winner, our finalists, our judges, and this year's Penn Faulkner Literary Champion, NPR host Terry Gross. Sponsorships are on sale now. The link is in the chat. Again, check your chat. Um, you can also sign up through that link to receive a notification as soon as we put single tickets on sale later this spring. So we hope you'll do that so that we can get to you as soon as possible. It's going to be a fantastic evening. We really hope you'll join us for that celebration. Um, Thank you again to Beth Ann, to Nicole, to Isaac, to Margot. Uh, we so appreciate you all being here and chatting tonight. To everyone else, we hope we'll see you again soon and good night. Thank you. I'm going to do it again. Thank, just you. Thank you, everybody. Also, Penn Faulkner does Thank amazing you. stuff for students, so you should donate. <laughs> totally. <laughs> good night, everyone.